Well, hey, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name's Dave Drum. I get the opportunity to serve as the men's director here. Uh, this is not exactly my day job. Uh, if we haven't met, I actually work for the sheriff's office. Uh, so my last three weeks or so has been a, a little busy. Um, and more specifically, I actually work Pine Island. So if you've seen a picture from there, um, it actually doesn't do it justice. So anyways. I'm glad you're here because this is a little bit of normal for me, and again, my last three weeks have been anything but normal. So if you have been around pretty much any church for any length of time, especially when it comes to men's ministry, there's one verse that you've probably heard over and over again. Proverbs 27, 17. Anybody familiar with it? Maybe once or twice? Okay, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, or one friend sharpens another, or one person sharpens another, depending upon which translation you're looking at. And um, it's not that I don't like that verse, it's just used so much. And there's been times where I, I've asked guys, like, hey, what does that mean? They're like, oh, well, you know, that's, you know, guys sharpening each other. Like, yeah, that's what the words say. Um, so tonight, actually what I want to talk about is I want to give you guys a quick story about how this actually played out in my life somewhat recently. Um, and uh, the way it starts is back in July, uh, my wife and I, we decide we're going to buy a new car, right? So we do all the shopping around and actually we got this great deal. We got a, a, a Jeep SUV, not like the cool Jeep with the, you know, the rag top and all that. No, no, no. I got like the, the soccer mom Jeep. But it's still cool and it's way nicer than I thought I was going to get. It's brand new. Thing had 33 miles on it. I was super excited about it. So we go to the dealership, we pick it out, you know, we sign all the paperwork. It takes hours and hours. And we leave the dealership, and it's nighttime, so we're going to go get dinner. And we're sitting at dinner together talking about this new Jeep that we bought. And the cool thing was we were both looking at it the same way. We looked at it as this really great blessing that God had given us. We were thankful for it. We were very grateful for it. We were excited about it. So we finished dinner. We drive home. Everything's wonderful in the house of drum. So the next morning I get up, you know, do some, run some errands, and, and I'm like, oh, I need to go get a new transponder for, for my new car. And I'm going to drive over to Leeway, and as I'm driving down the road, see, here's what you got to know. My old car, um, it didn't smell that nice. Uh, the stereo was horrible, and I didn't really like it at all. So now I'm in this brand new Jeep. The stereo is incredible. And, you know, it's got that new car smell. So, like, I'm driving down the road. I got the music on louder than it should be. I'm enjoying myself. I'm inhaling those new car smell fumes. And I get about two miles down the road, and the dashboard changes. It lights up. There's all these little bells going off. And I realize it's the, the low tire pressure warning. And I literally have 33 miles on this car. And the little diagram comes up and it's got all the pressure. It's like, you know, one car, tire's got 36, another one's 35, another one's 36, 27, 25, 23. And even though I'm in the car by myself driving down the road, I say out loud, man, there ain't no way. Ain't no way I got a flat tire. So I quick make a U-turn and I pull off the side of the road. And by the time I make it into the grass, flat, totally flat. Now there's some side notes to this story that I want you guys to, to know. Um, so for most of us in this room, um, you know, buying new cars for, for years and years, there's this luxury piece of equipment that was in a lot of those cars. Anybody know what it is? Spare tire. Yeah, apparently that's a thing that they don't do anymore. Um, so then another side note is, is, as some of you guys know, back in, in uh, June I had neck surgery. So at this point in the story, I'm like three weeks post-op, and I'm not allowed to like move anything, lift anything, push anything, pull anything, nothing. In fact, this is like one of the first times I'm driving on my own uh, because of all the medications I was taking. So 
Well, and I guess it didn't matter that I couldn't lift anything because, you know, there's no spare tire in the car. Um, and then just to, just to make sure that God's making his point to me, uh, it's about to rain because, you know, it's July in South Florida. So all of that's going on at once. And I call my wife and I'm like, you're never going to believe this. So she, of course, is like quick to solutions. Hey, call the sales guy. Do this, do this. I'm like, I didn't want to hear any of it. Why? Because I was mad that I'm on the side of the road in my brand new car that's got, you know, a whopping 33 miles on it, and I got a flat tire. So I'm angry at mm, everybody. So instead of a spare tire, what they give me was this little pump and it's got this can of like fancy fix a flat on it. And that's what I'm supposed to patch my tire with. So I'm figuring out like which tube goes into the tire first and I'm, I'm reading over it. And as I'm staring at this tire, waiting for it to start to rain, I hear this voice. Man, I thought that was you. And it's my friend Ben. My friend Ben happened to be driving by, doesn't recognize the car because you know I bought it like 10 hours before. Uh, but he sees me and he pulls over and he stops to, to uh, you know, see if I need help. Well, what, I'm, what I want to tell you is you got to have a friend like Ben in your life. So he shows up and we're standing there and, and he's helping me with this stupid fix a flat thing. And we're watching it and it, it's kind of working and I'm watching the pressure gauge go up. It's like, okay. And then there's this sound. And it's kind of like a, a baby that kind of farts, but kind of not. Um, and it was the sound of the fix a flat not fixing the flat. Um, the, apparently the hole was too big. So Ben and I watched this thing go back down to zero. Now I'm really mad. Because here, here's the thing. The simple solution to all of this is to call roadside assistance, right? Have them come out, fix this thing. Uh, here's the problem. The roadside assistance package, it gets mailed to you. And I don't know if I mentioned this, I've only had the thing for 10 hours, so I haven't gotten the mail yet. So Ben being the guy that he is, he runs to his house to get a tire patch. And I get on the phone to the sales guy, who I'm not real happy with, because the first thing he says is, oh, well, there's this fancy fix-a-flat thing. Did you try that yet? I let him know I wasn't real impressed with his product. Um, and then I more or less hung up on him because he didn't want to hear what else I had to say. So Ben comes back and, and, and now Ben has, has gotten the patch kit and he's in the process of plugging the tire and I'm doing the super manly thing of holding an umbrella over my friend because, you know, again, I can't push, pull, move, touch, anything. Um, so it was awesome. So finally the patch holes holds and we start driving back to my house. And, uh, you know, we, we, we call for the tow truck, which, you know, is awesome because it's an automated system, which sounds convenient right up except for the point that I wanted to yell at somebody and the computer didn't care. So we're going to drive back to my house. Ben's following me. The storm is like on us now. Um, and he's following me because we weren't real sure that it's going to hold. But I call my wife and I say, you know, it's a really good thing Ben was there. Aside from the obvious part where he patched my tire, but besides that. Because if Ben wasn't standing there, I probably would have gone off on the sales guy on the phone. But what's funny is in the moment, sitting there on the side of the road, it's starting to rain. The tire's flat, the fix of flat doesn't work. I'm trying to get through this automated system. I look over at Ben in the middle of all of this, and I said, you know, there's a message here. I just don't know what it is yet. And that's the funny thing. Even in that moment when I wasn't exactly oozing the love of Jesus, you know, out of all of my pores, um, I knew that God was there and that, and that God was present, and he was doing something. See, how we choose to see our situations is just that. It's a choice. But it's a choice we actually have to make ahead of the time, ahead of the flat tire. We have to make the choice daily. Because otherwise what happens is our situation is going to give us a perspective instead of us giving the situation our perspective. 
if that makes sense. So here's the thing, maybe you're like me and maybe you have a lot of friends that would stop and help you fix the tire. But not all of my friends who would have helped me fix the tire would have helped me fix my attitude, would have helped me fix my behavior or my response in that situation. Because, see, here's the thing. Much like choosing my attitude before the situation arrives, choosing who's in my circle, choosing who my friends are, who my closest friends are, helps dictate that response. Because at the end of the day, part of our response is partially dictated by who we surround ourselves with. See, I'll tell you, not all of my relationships are that great. You know, again, I have a lot of friends who would have pulled over and stopped to help me. Uh, I have one friend, uh, a guy I grew up with. I've known him since we were about 12 years old. Uh, I refer to him lovingly as my dumb friend, Eric. And my dumb friend, Eric, if he would have been driving past me, he would have stopped. He would have stopped. He would have helped me with the tire. He would have helped me get back to my house absolutely 100% of the time. But when I got on that phone, he would have been fanning the flames. He, he would have been 100% on my side. He'd have been my biggest cheerleader. Yeah, man, tell him. Tell him to come out here and fix this tire. Yeah. But that's not really what I needed in the moment. See, because my friend Eric, he's for me. Or I'm sorry, my friend Eric, he, he, he's on my side. Let me say it that way. Eric is on my side. But Ben, Ben is for me. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, what's the difference between the two? See, because if someone's on your side, no matter where you're standing, no matter what your pers perspective is, no matter what emotions you have going, they're with you. They are picking up exactly what you're feeling, and they are echoing it. They are going to be your cheerleader. But if somebody's for you, well, they're going to stand where they know you want to be, and they're going to try and help get you there. And the big thing there is, why would I change my behavior around somebody if they don't know who I'm trying to be? Okay. Why would I change the things I say in front of somebody if they don't know who I'm trying to become? See, because when I have someone around me who is for me, not just on my side, but someone who's for me, then we've decided in advance, this is who I'm trying to become. This is the direction I'm trying to take my life. These are the goals I have. And those things don't change just because I have a flat tire. Those values don't shift because I got bad news today. And I don't stop trying to become who I am called to become just because the circumstances aren't ideal. But here's the thing. Two things have to happen if you want to have people who are for you, around you. They've got to know who you want to become. They want to know what direction you're trying to head. And the only way that happens is if I'm willing to let them in on it. I have to be willing to share those goals and that direction with the people around me. And then the other thing that has to happen is they have to have my permission to call me out on it, to encourage me back to where I'm going. Now, Ben didn't say, wow, you're being kind of angry. I don't know that that models uh, Jesus' response. But he was there. And I knew that if I lost it on the phone to this sales guy who incidentally did not put the screw in my tire, if I would have gone off on him, which is what my gut wanted, we probably would have had a conversation later. But that's exactly what someone who's for me should do. See, now, all of us in this room are guilty of, at one point or another, be, being a cheerleader for somebody else. But what's worse 
is there's probably some of us who are guilty of only wanting a cheerleader around us. Because quite frankly, when I'm mad, what my anger wants is a cheerleader. Because I want to be justified in my emotions. Because if I'm not justified in my emotions, then I'm un unreasonable, I'm irrational. And how many of us love to be called unreasonable? Yeah, exactly, that's what I thought. But like I said, these are decisions we make ahead of time, before trouble shows up. And the way you do that in terms of finding those friends, because let's face it, guys, we overcomplicate this, this process way too much, way too frequently, we overcomplicate this. We call it accountability, and that sounds like a difficult, difficult word. But really what it is is cho choosing to be a brother to somebody else and let them be a brother to us. What you do is you think of the guys you like spending time with. Okay, start there. Somebody you actually enjoy spending time with because that makes the whole process a little more enjoyable. You find somebody who you like being around and then you figure out, hey, are, are they like trying to follow Jesus too? Because if the answer to that is yes, and you like being around them, it's real simple. You go to them and you say, hey man, I'm trying really hard to live the way Jesus wants me to. And I'm not always good at it. You think you could help me with that? That's it. That's the entire conversation. Because if you're talking to a friend, chances are they're going to reciprocate that. But what I'll tell you is that's the easy part. The easy part is just having that initial dialogue of, yeah, man, I want to help you get better. Will you help me get better? The hard part is staying in that space for a long time. Not just hanging back, waiting for your friend to, to step out of line so you can be like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. No, it's walking with them. Hey, man, what do you, how'd that thing happen at work? You, you said that was going to mess with you a little bit, having that meeting with so-and-so. You know, how, how'd that pan out? Like, how's, how's the family doing? When's the last time you had a date night with your wife? How, how are you doing financially? Like, you, you've spent a lot of money recently. You bought a boat, you bought this, you bought that. Like, you guys okay? Are you in debt up to your eyeballs? But see, as guys, it's like, well, I mean, I'm willing to ask them, but, you know, I don't necessarily want them poking around my life. You can't have it just one way. This has to go both ways. That's what being brothers are. That's what iron sharpening iron looks like. It's when your behavior starts to become modified because the people you surround, your with, surround yourself with are watching. When you know, hey, I can't respond this way because I'm near these people. Now, that's not putting on a show. It's holding yourself accountable. It's beginning to change your reactions. Your reactions will change knowing the people around you's reactions are different than what your gut instincts are. Collectively, we're gonna make mistakes. Collectively, we're gonna respond poorly at times. Collectively, we are gonna say the wrong thing. But there's grace for that. There's grace for each other. But it's all about growth, direction, and change. So, as a final disclaimer before we, we move on into just some uh, discussion time at the tables. First off, don't ditch your dumb friends. It's entirely possible that the reason your friends are dumb is because all they have around them are cheerleaders. People who take their side no matter what their reaction is and cheer them on in that reaction. Maybe it's time to, to try and change your role in their life to where you're for them and you help them as well. So when we go to the tables, there, there are some questions there, but there are also two challenges. See, the first challenge is, well, scrolled right past it. The first challenge is simple. Tell somebody at your table where you're trying to improve. Now, don't overcomplicate it. If what you're trying to improve on is, you know what, I don't ever read my Bible, so um, I wanna read the Bible five minutes a day. 
every day, just five minutes. That's, that's way more than I've ever read it. So five minutes a day. Will, will you hold me accountable? Will you text me, call me, send me an email, whatever? I want to read the Bible for five minutes a day. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a lofty goal. But ask them to hold you accountable to that. And then the second challenge is, when somebody tells you where they're trying to improve, do what they've asked you to do and hold them accountable. Because that's when you know you've got a brother and not just another cheerleader. Cheerleaders are cheap and they're easy to find. But what we're looking for here is brotherhood. So before I turn you guys over to the table, I just wanna pray for us real quick and uh, then you guys will have time to uh, converse. Heavenly Father, thank you again for these men. Thank you for this time together. Father, I just ask that you give us courage. Convict our hearts. Let us know where those areas are that you're calling us to grow, where you're calling us out. Give us the courage and the strength to not only ask for accountability, but to give it as well and to do it lovingly. Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.